I want to very briefly just update you on the whole situation relating to the lockdown. I had another a kind of Zoom call with officials at number 10 yesterday afternoon with a range of Christian leaders speaking um, about the uh, current state of lockdown and how things are going to develop. I'd love to be able to bring you um, lots of good news and clarity and unfortunately I'm not able to at all. Um, I think yesterday's meeting was interesting just because of the significantly increased hostility I think on the part of very many of the church leaders engaging with government as they express their frustration at the lack of clarity and the lack of um, any apparent progress towards easing lockdown, particularly as they see shops opening, public um, uh, transport opening. Um, uh, there is this feeling that uh, kind of places of worship, churches are not being fairly and equally treated. And that was vocally expressed by a significant number of contributors uh, to the call. There's still no clarity on the issue of allowing marriages and small marriages, even those th though those are allowed in Northern Ireland. Um, as I understand it, several government ministers have written asking for marriages to be allowed. The blockage there was, uh, is they're waiting for the Prime Minister to make a decision. So um, uh, that's the challenge uh, in relation to um, uh, marriages. The hope is that small marriages may well be allowed after the 4th of July, but there's been no decision there. Similarly, there's no decision, in fact, on whether or not to reduce social distancing from two metres to one metre. Um, the next crucial date is the 25th of June, when the current lockdown regulations will be reviewed and decisions are being made. It's still the case that there will be no um, uh, opening of places of worship before the 4th of uh, July. Um, uh, government officials did indicate that actually it's possible that after the 25th of June restrictions might be reimposed. It entirely depends on where the R rate goes um, uh, uh, for the uh, virus. Um, there was some indication as to what might happen after the 4th of July um, and it seems there, there are two potential directions things might go in. One is that uh, places of worship might be able to open to allow gathered corporate worship with social distancing and cleaning but probably with no singing uh, being permitted. The other possibility is of churches being allowed to or places of worship being allowed to open only for specific events, specific types of services. In other words, um, possibly just for small weddings, funerals, post-funeral gatherings, uh, naming ceremonies, coming of age ceremonies and ordinations. In other words, uh, not for the things that are the ordinary kind of gathered worship of the people of God. And I think it is entirely unclear as to what those uh, sort of decision might be. So that's just to fill you in on where we're at, that's all we know. Please don't shoot me, I'm only the messenger. Um, as I can tell you, there was a significant amount of kickback um, uh, from leaders across a range of uh, churches um, uh, uh, about that. It's very clear there is no real understanding of evangelical churches and why they want to gather for corporate worship. So um, pray on, um, but just to keep you in the loop as to where things um, uh, might uh, be going uh, there. Um, uh, government also said, and I think it's important that we hear this, is that the officials explain that one of the reasons for this is because looking at the worldwide evidence, it's clear that places of worship have been centers of virus spread. And um, that is very much in their minds. And so there is immense concern about that. That may also be bound up with issues of the greater spread of virus and impact on BAME communities as well. So um, it's worth bearing in mind that there is a genuine concern about places of worship and the impact they have on the spread of the virus. That's all I know. Um, uh, it's just to update you on what's happening. There'll be another call in two weeks time um, uh, to discuss further. Those are the updates. I want us, as usual, to start by just turning to God's word um, as we begin our time together. And as we think about evangelism, I'd just like to um, remind you of Romans uh, 1 verse 16, where Paul writes this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. I think uh, Paul um, uh, recognises uh, this uh, in the way he uh, writes verse 16 and begins his letter to the Romans. But one of the greatest barriers to um, evangelism is um, the danger of being ashamed of the gospel. And I think we need to recognise that um, actually for us, that is very often a major barrier to our evangelism. We are uh, ashamed of the gospel. Well, why is it we might be ashamed of the gospel? Well, I think there are a couple of key reasons why we become ashamed of the gospel. They're a result of perhaps um, external and internal pressure. The external pressure is the cultural unacceptability of the gospel. 
The gospel is a message about rescue from God's wrath and the judgment to come. The gospel um, declares that we are sinners who need to be forgiven. We're not good people, but we're wicked people. And that is a message which is unacceptable to a world that wants to be told uh, that it is uh, good, that wants to believe that it is uh, righteous. So we're under immense cultural pressure um, because the gospel is an unacceptable message. Um, it's also seen as being an exclusive and an intolerant uh, message. One of the things that has struck me in this coronavirus crisis is that is there's been many broadcast services on radio or television, uh, some of them at the time of Easter. What to me was very depressing is how few of them really talked of the genuine gospel hope. There was talk in vague terms of hope and resurrection and building a better society, but nobody publicly declared the reality of sin, the reality of God's coming judgment, the need to be saved uh, from that. We're in danger of being ashamed of the gospel because of that external pressure. But I also wonder if uh, for us, perhaps more so, there's a danger of an internal doubt um, that causes us to be ashamed of the gospel. And I, I think this is as a result of our experiential deficit. In other words, we preach and we share the gospel, but perhaps we see little fruit from the gospel. And that lack of experience of conversions um, uh, causes us to begin to become ashamed of the gospel message. It, it makes us more reluctant to uh, preach it and proclaim it. I think that's an issue Paul wrestled with clearly in Romans. So for him, the um, experiential deficit was that so few people amongst the Jews believed the gospel and responded to this uh, kind of message. The very people who ought to have understood and ought to have responded didn't. Um, and I think for many of our churches and for many of our people, this experiential deficit is a key reason why we become ashamed of the gospel and we lose heart. We're uh, in the process of analyzing data from FIEC churches and in the last year, We've had reports of about 800 or so conversions across the FIEC family. Now, uh, at one level, that's wonderfully encouraging, but that's 620 churches. And when you think of all the effort that goes into evangelism, events, uh, outreach, prayer, um, uh, it's understandable why people may become discouraged. And of course, many of those conversions are concentrated in uh, sort of churches in particular places, city centers, working in different communities. So we become ashamed of the gospel because of the external pressure and our internal doubt. And we need to, if we're going to keep working in evangelism, overcome that shame. How do we do that? Well, how do we overcome um, our shame? Well, two things here, it seems to me, are crucially important. Um, uh, first of all, we need to live by faith in God's word. So um, uh, 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 we're not just saved by faith, but we're called as Christians to live by faith. And uh, here in uh, verse 16, Paul reminds us of the unchanging truth that it's the gospel that is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. We need to believe and trust what God says about the gospel. It's his power. It's his chosen means. There is no other means by which people are brought to salvation. So we need to have faith in uh, God's uh, word to trust what he says. And then secondly, we need to trust in God's sovereign purposes. In many ways, uh, Paul spends considerable time in Romans 9 to 11 answering the question, why is it that more Jews are not being converted? Um, uh, even though he's praying earnestly, he's preaching uh, boldly. And the answer he comes back to is really that God is sovereign. Uh, God is sovereign in his purposes in uh, evangelism. We pray, we preach, we proclaim, but ultimately God is uh, sovereign. And uh, as we uh, look at the world, uh, we might in our own experience um, uh, feel that the gospel is not bearing a great deal of fruit, but all around the world, the gospel message is being proclaimed and people are turning to Christ and its power is being demonstrated. We long for that to be more the case here, but we need to overcome our shame by uh, having faith in God's word and trusting in God's sovereign purposes. Uh, let's pray as we begin. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for the gospel. Thank you that it is your power for salvation. Thank you that it's the way that you rescue uh, men and women, boys and girls, from the wrath to come. We ask that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, either because of the cultural pressure or because of our own doubts. Instead, please would we trust your word and trust in your good sovereign purposes. May this uh, sort of webinar today be a real help and encouragement to us as we seek to keep the work of evangelism central in our churches. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremy, um, over to you. Thanks so much, John, and thanks for inviting me. Brothers, I want to encourage you. I believe this is the gospel hour. I believe there's never been such an opportunity and such an openness 
as, as now. As John said, whether that results in conversions, that's up to God. But my experience has been that people have been the most open to the gospel in the last three months in lockdown than in any period before the Second World War, uh, since the Second World War. Now, just to explain what, who am I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not an FIEC pastor. I'm actually a terrible banker, right? Shocking. But I am the son of an of a evangelical free pastor and, and a nephew. And um, I worked in the city. Eight years ago, I got cancer. Five years ago, I was told I had 18 months to live. And God's turned me into an accidental evangelist, right? And I can tell you, if you think you've got a short time to live, it gives you a powerful impetus, like a turbo boost, to get out there and, and spread the good word. I've written a book, which maybe some of you have seen, and I recognize a number of you. Thanks for inviting me to your churches beyond the big C. And over the last five years, I've been doing a lot of evangelistic talks. But in the last, in the last three months, it's been unbelievable. I would say I've had one a day, roughly, so probably 70 or 80 which is, I'm, I'm in chemotherapy at the moment, so I couldn't travel anyway. So here I am sitting in my chair, mainly small churches, lots of uh, FIEC and other churches that have never done any evangelistic events before, schools, universities, businesses. I've done about a dozen law firms. I've had law firms where they said, if we had an event with Christians, for a, a Christian event, we got five people, we'd open a bottle of champagne. We got a hundred. So what's happening is, I think, two things. One, we're playing on home ground. And this is especially powerful for me because I can, from personal experience, trust me, talk about what it's like living in the face of death. And people are sobered up, friends, and they need to be sobered up for the reason that John said, because they're facing judgment, they're facing eternal separation from God. And I tell you, that daily death toll 600, 500, 700, 400, that really sears in people's minds. So if we ever had an opportunity, if we could ever play on our home turf and talk about something that people want to hear about, hope in the face of death, now is the time. The, the other factor I think is, is technology. And I, I believe, and John mentioned that, that God's sovereignty, if you look at the early church, God used his sovereign purposes to, to, if you like, dissipate the message throughout the Roman Empire. And by the way, he used suffering, right? If you read in Acts, the church was persecuted, so it spread all over the Near East. And as, as people went out, they preached the word. Now, we're not being persecuted by the authorities yet, but coronavirus has broken down those walls. And if you think about technology, imagine we weren't 108 pastors. Imagine we were 92 owners of the professional football clubs in England, and we were having this meeting. And we realized that for well, however long, we had had a model where you could only consume our product if you came along to the stadium. No TV, no radio, no match of the day, no live matches, nothing. But I would suggest gently, friends, that's the situation we've been in, right? Most churches have not done anything, particularly on technology. And now everybody is on technology. And I've been so encouraged by some of these small churches even in some cases where there's no church, groups of Christians, I had one last week, who just got together, there's no decent evangelical church in their area, they said, let's have an evangelistic event. So technology gives the non-Christian a chance to dip their toe in the water. And I, I believe that's really important because I think for non-Christians, they find it difficult and challenging to go to church. I, I wish that wasn't so, but this allows them in an anonymous way to, to look in. What's also very striking to me is some of these smaller churches where they have posted it on YouTube afterwards. And sometimes they've had 10 to 15 times the number of people watching it afterwards who have watched it before, who have watched it live. Now, in some cases, you may say, well, do people watch it for five minutes and then give up? Yeah, that may be so. But even so, you can get a lot of the gospel in in, in five minutes. So I really believe that this is an amazing opportunity for, for the church. And I, I just have a few suggestions now of things that I found work, and I, I believe they're also more importantly biblical, right? And what I'd like is to set out, if you like, a menu and invite you to choose and select from the menu. Because if we look at the book of Acts, all sorts of different things happen, don't they? And a lot of evangelism happens in what you might call a fairly random way. Philip is suddenly transported. He starts talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. Paul and um, uh, Peter and John are on their way to the temple and they, 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 they meet the beggar. 
and that I believe is is what's happening now that God is using those external events to create a real openness in people so just a few thoughts that your church is right I'm not even a pastor I'm a banker terrible you must choose what's right for you but these are my suggestions one when we can reopen please don't give up on technology not least for people like me, I, it, it probably, I, I, I may never be able to go back to church again. I've got so many problems with my immune system, as has our pastor, by the way, so we, we may be always online. And if we can have a hybrid model, where especially for evangelistic events, people can dip their toes in the water. Secondly, I believe one of the most important things is, is to create an environment which can be interactive. So for me, I typically preach the gospel for about 20 minutes, in, 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 in the evangelistic event. By the way, I love the interview format because that's disarming and accessible for non-Christians. You can preach just as well in an interview format as, as preaching, but it, it, it makes it easy to understand and follow for the non-Christians. And then the thing I, I love is, is the questions. And you get amazing questions from, from the people watching. But there's also things you can use if you're technologically inclined like Slideo or Pigeonhole, which enable people to log questions, and then they, you can vote them up or down. And the more we can draw the non-Christian in and enable them to ask questions and, and, and kind of scratch where it itches, all, all the better. And I believe that's the model the Lord used. Nobody used more questions than the Lord Jesus. Um, an encouragement here, my, my father was pastor for 50 years of a very small church, very small with about 40 members. And um, I believe this is the hour of the small church. Why? Because on, as the joke goes, on the internet, everybody can be a dog. And on the internet, a small church and a large church, it's all the same. Nobody can see what's, what's going on. And friends, local is beautiful and small is beautiful. People, I believe, I'm, I'm in Kent, right? In Kent, they're, they're rediscovering the importance of locality and community. And I believe some of that will remain even after lockdown. So people are willing to come along to a local church, I, I don't want to insult anyone who's listening, but I've been in churches where I don't even know where the place is. They've invited me. I've never even heard of the place, let alone the church. And God bless them. They've had, you know, some people 10, some 20, some 50. It doesn't matter, does it? But there's a kind of connection there with the locality. Now, maybe you think, well, I'm not so interested in, in events. Other things that churches have done, boxes of books. There's a friend of mine, Paul, who's a, a Baptist pastor in Buckinghamshire. He's in a tiny, tiny church, which is virtually shut. And he just puts outside, he's on the village green, a box of books, help yourself. And even my feeble copy, one day he got rid of seven copies on one day. People just help themselves. It's that same principle of accessibility. Next, I believe, friends, there's an intrinsic power in God's word. I mean, that's what John said. There's something supernatural and amazing, but how do we make it available? Well, one thing I've found is, is this, if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. The Word One-to-One -one is simply John's Gospel with notes. It's available on other books. And also in lockdown, as well as the, the, the kind of collective things, I've found a lot of my friends, because of the fact, as I mentioned, especially because of the fear of death, and maybe because I have my secret weapon, right, cancer, is, is to say, would you like to have a chat with me about the Bible? And lots and lots of people say yes. And that's something where I think we can also encourage people in the congregation to have a go. You know, just invite a friend. Would you like to Zoom with me? Would you like to have a chat about God's word? This, this kind of journeying with people is very important. I, in my experience, pretty much everybody who comes to faith does so because an, a Christian is, is helping them along the way, is guiding them. And if you think of the Bible, think of the road to Emmaus. The people there, they knew all the facts, right? They'd been told by the women that morning, but they didn't believe. And it took someone, the Lord, coming alongside them and opening up the scriptures to, to then result in we're not, we're not our hearts burning within us as we walked along the way. So that burning, that unthawing of non-Christian hearts requires a Christian to help them. And I appreciate you're all incredibly busy. And I know what it's like to be a pastor. And I know what it's like to, to live in a, in a manse. But I, I, I do think um, two, two things specifically for pastors. One is I would encourage you I know this is a communist slogan, but it's a good one. I think that a hundred flowers bloom. If people in the churches, we've seen that in our church, people had different ideas in lockdown. Can we do this? Can we do that? Yeah, why not? Whatever God lays on your heart, as long as it's biblical and preaches the gospel. And then for pastors, and I know this is hard, but to the extent you can to model personal evangelism is really important. 
and I know that's tough because like, the, the, the job of being a pastor is tough and there's so many demands, but to the extent possible, to be able to show to your, your flock that, look, I also, the pastor, have got non-Christian friends and I chat with them about the gospel. I think that's really powerful and helps the average Christian in the pew think, yeah, I could do that. My, my final point then is um, follow up. I think if there's one thing we can particularly improve on from evangelistic events or from, from helping people in our church, it's, it's follow up. What's the next step? I, I always end my talks with something like this. I say, look, being a Christian is not about Richard Dawkins believing in something you, you, you know isn't really true. No, it's based on evidence. Look at yourself and what should you look at? You should look friends at the Bible, right? That's where the, the power isn't in us. The power is in, in God's word and God's word hasn't changed. The facts, as John mentioned, are relevant, but the, the word of God, friends, is intrinsically powerful. I really believe that with all my heart. And I, if we can guide people on how to do that, if we can journey with them. The word one-to-one -one is a great way of doing it. Christianity explored. Some churches run their own kind of seekers thing. That's great. So brothers, I really want to encourage you. Thanks so much for listening to me. And I'm really happy to take questions. But just in summary, I really believe with all my heart that this is the hour where people are the most open since 1945. Why? Because they're afraid of dying. And we have the answer. If there was ever a time that we should, we should really go for it, now is the time. And, and I'm so encouraged by all these churches. And it's not just me, there's lots of other people. I was talking to Roger Carswell, Rico Tice, Glenn Scrivener, many other evangelists. We're all finding the same thing. It's amazing. It's amazing. God, as I believe, instituted and allowed coronavirus to break down the wall separating the church from the world and allow the gospel message to go out. Now, what happens now, I've not the faintest idea, but I believe if we have confidence in God's word and if we make God's word available in an accessible form, then God will bless that. Thank you so much for listening to me and may God bless each one of you richly. Thank you, John. As I, uh, as I begin to share some thoughts on what we've been doing to try and keep evangelism central uh, in, uh, in the local church here, I'm really conscious that I would uh, love to be uh, listening to others at this point, hearing what you're doing. Uh, I can tell you what we're doing. I can tell you the areas that we're trying to think through. Uh, but the truth is we still have a long way to go to be making evangelism central uh, in the life of our church. Uh, in the, uh, the sovereignty of God, when the lockdown began, uh, we were preaching through uh, 1 Timothy, and 1 Timothy, as you know, is an urgent plea for us to keep the gospel front and centre in the life of the church. Uh, and at the heart of uh, Paul's uh, letter uh, is that famous statement uh, about uh, the church. The church is God's household, uh, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation uh, of the truth. Uh, our job, in other words, is to hold up and hold out the truth so that uh, uh, Christians live godly lives, people hear the gospel and believe it, uh, and Christ is glorified. Uh, I found um, uh, 1 Timothy really uh, helpful for us at the start of lockdown. It's a reminder that we are always prone to drift and lose our way, and we need to constantly work to keep the gospel at the heart of everything we do uh, as a local church. And I think our own experience as a church family is that the moment we stop our uh, focusing on evangelism, uh, the moment we start to highlight other things, even if they're good things, uh, we lose uh, our way uh, with uh, the gospel. And in that sense, lockdown doesn't change anything. Um, uh, lockdown, in lockdown, we still need to keep the gospel front and center. Uh, and yet, of course, lockdown does change something. So the question is, how do we keep it central? Well, I think the, I think the answer is that we try to keep the gospel central uh, in the same ways that we did before, albeit they look a bit different now. So how, how are we doing that as a, as a church? Let me talk about um, Sundays and church meetings, uh, first of all. Uh, lo long before lockdown began, uh, we started working through the Vine Project with a, a working group. Some of you will know that book. It comes off the back of the trellis uh, and the vine. And we were really challenged in that by the idea of making Sunday a flagship. And what they mean by this is that Sunday is not only our prime time for learning Christ, but also for setting the tone and the direction for everything we do as a, as a church. Sunday is where our character, it's where our purposes, it's where our culture 
are, are most clearly expressed. It's where we communicate most often and most clearly what we're about. And I think that means uh, two things uh, for us. We, we want to continue to express and reinforce our convictions uh, while we're in lockdown, our, our convictions about church as family, our convictions about the importance of making disciples. We want to keep expressing and reinforcing those convictions for the church family. I think the other thing it means for us is that we want to work hard at making our services accessible for those who don't normally come to church, uh, and particularly for those uh, who are not uh, Christians. Uh, like many of you at the start of lockdown, we made the decision that we were going to put our morning service on uh, YouTube uh, and we set up uh, a YouTube channel uh, and uh, we were quickly surprised by the number of views that we were getting, not, not big numbers by any means, but more than we would normally get and more than we expected to get. We were conscious that other people uh, were joining us uh, and we knew that in the church family, people were sharing the link with their friends and their family, colleagues, etc. Uh, people were telling us that they found it easier to do that than invite somebody along uh, to church. And so in the light of that, uh, in the run up to Easter, we started to plug an online Christianity Explore course in our services uh, and with the church family. We encourage people to invite folk who were watching or, or with whom they were uh, talking about the Lord Jesus. And at first, I think we were really hopeful that we might have a number of people uh, join us on that course. What was interesting for us is that only one person signed up and that person is now doing the course with, uh, with their friend from the church family. But as we reflected on that experience as a church leadership, it struck us that it's really quite a big uh, jump to go from watching a service to, uh, or, uh, or being part of a service to actually signing up for a course. Uh, and it got us uh, to thinking about how we could help bridge that gap for people. Uh, and I, I'm conscious from talking with some of you that others have been wrestling with that very same uh, issue. Now we have a, a monthly uh, members meeting. It's something that I inherited when I first came to St. Neots, something that I am now deeply committed to. I think it's a great opportunity for us to engage with our church family, to share our vision with them and to get their input. And at every church meeting, we do four things. We, we ask a member of the church family to share something that God has been teaching them from the Bible. We have a discussion item. Uh, we share news uh, and then we pray. And we continue to hold our church meetings during lockdown. And at our first church meeting in lockdown, we asked the church family how we could continue to reach out and build one another up under lockdown. Uh, we wanted to get people thinking and talking and praying about, uh, about this. And at the same time, one of our church members sent me an email. Uh, and in the email, they suggested that we run an online events week, something similar to a, a university missions week. And the idea was that over the course of a week, we release a, a series of videos each lunchtime and each evening. The idea being that across the week, it would build a sense of momentum. The lunchtime videos would essentially be short apologetic talks, uh, answering a question that we thought non-Christians were asking. And then the evening videos would be interviews with members of the church family that would relate in some way to the theme of the lunchtime uh, talk. We discussed it as elders, we thought it was a great idea, uh, and we decided to give it a go. We, we wanted the videos to be uh, short, so the lunchtime talks would be about five to seven minutes long, the interviews a little bit longer, about 10 minutes, but we also wanted them to be well done because we wanted people to be happy and willing to share them with their friends on social media. We also thought it would be a useful resource that we could continue to use long after the week was over. So we called the week, Can God Fix the World? And we gave ourselves three weeks to produce the videos. Uh, and then at the, uh, the start of June, uh, in that first week, we released the videos across the week. Uh, we produced a number of things to help the church get behind the week. So we produced a video uh, trailer to advertise the week and we put that on our website and we promoted it in our meetings and services. We produced a pack for church members 
explaining what we were doing and why we were doing it and how they could take part. And that pack included instructions for how to share things on social media for those who weren't familiar with it. It, it also included a list of prayer points that people could be praying through. Uh, and then we uh, put up posters for people, or we produced posters that people could put up in the, the front windows of their, their homes. Uh, and we encourage people to be sharing the videos and praying for opportunities to talk about them with family and friends and neighbours. Uh, we held two prayer meetings, one at the start of the week, one at the end of the week. And we also sent out an email each day with details of the videos and the things that we wanted folk to be praying for. Uh, as the week began to draw to a close, we started advertising another online Christianity Explore course uh, that would begin after the week uh, was over. But my reflections having done that is that I'm really glad we did it. It was a really good way for us at that point of keeping evangelism central and encouraging the church to be reaching out with the gospel. If I'm honest, I don't know whether we had as many views as we hoped we might, uh, but we still did get a good number of views. People did share them and we know that people have been watching them. I think with hindsight, three weeks wasn't really long enough for us to prepare properly for the week. It was a push to get everything ready. And my observation is that these things often take longer to organise uh, than you think they will. And I think because of the, uh, the squeeze to get everything ready in three weeks, we probably ended up sacrificing a bit on the quality side uh, as a result. It, it would probably also have been helpful uh, to have sent out the info pack to the church earlier. So how do we try and keep evangelism central? Well, one way is through our, our services and our church meetings. And out of that church meeting came that idea for the events week. But there are other ways in which we're trying to keep evangelism central, uh, preaching uh, and prayer. So as I said, uh, we were doing a series on 1 Timothy uh, when uh, lockdown began. Uh, and like many of you, we stepped out of that series uh, and I preached a series of three sermons responding to the pandemic. Uh, I then preached on the resurrection over Easter before coming back to the series on 1 Timothy just to finish it. Uh, in my preaching, I've tried to keep the non-Christian uh, clearly in view, recognising that not everyone will be a believer, therefore trying to teach the gospel to challenge common assumptions that people have uh, and to keep calling uh, for uh, a response from people. Uh, after we finished the series on 1 Timothy, we chose to look at Luke chapters 22 and 23 because I wanted to fix people's eyes uh, on Christ. Uh, I'm conscious that the more Christ means to us as believers, the more that we will want to speak of him, both with each other, but also with those who are not Christians. Uh, I want us to see him more clearly and love him more dearly and follow him more nearly. But I also want to keep asking the non-Christians who are watching, what do you think about Christ? Look at him, what do you think about him? Uh, and this series on Luke 22 and 23 has given me lots of opportunities to keep saying that to people. Uh, I guess in my preaching as well, I'm also, uh, just as in our, our meetings, I'm also trying to express and reinforce uh, our convictions. Uh, and therefore, in the, the lessons that I draw out and the applications that I make, uh, I'm wanting to encourage the church family to make disciples. Now, of course, we, we do that both directly and indirectly. Uh, we do it directly with specific application, encouraging people to talk about Christ and to make the most of the opportunities that God gives us. But I think we also do that indirectly. Uh, by uh, helping people to grasp the, 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 the height and length and breadth and depth of God's love for us uh, and the, re the reality and the horror of God's judgment uh, and hell. So we try to keep um, uh, the gospel central in our preaching. We try to keep it central in our prayer life as well, uh, as we pray together on Sundays in our meetings uh, and services in our church prayer meetings, making sure that we're giving time to pray for those who are not Christians in home groups and, and the things that we encourage home groups to pray for and individually uh, as well. There's a real uh, encouragement to have a, a day of prayer with two other local FIEC churches last week uh, with three meetings spread across uh, the day. Uh, and uh, we, we tried to make sure that one of those meetings was focused on praying for 
our evangelism. Uh, other ways in which we're trying to keep evangelism central uh, in our elders meetings and with our, our staff team. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've had a number of joint elders meetings and staff meetings as we think about how we're responding to the current situation uh, and what we need to do to move things forward. Uh, in these meetings, one of our priorities is to think about how we're reaching out at the moment. Because the point is, if it's not our focus as an elders and staff team, it won't be our focus uh, as a church. I'm also conscious that I need to set an example in personal evangelism. If I am not looking for opportunities myself to talk to people about the Lord Jesus, if I'm not sharing the videos from Events Week, if I'm not putting that poster up in my window, if I'm not asking folk in home group to pray for me in my own evangelism, I can't expect others in the church family uh, to be doing that either. Another way in which we've been trying to keep evangelism central is in our communications. So the info that we send out to the church is another opportunity for us to express and reinforce our convictions. We send out a weekly church email with, uh, with news for people. And each time in that email, we try to include a section in which we give practical ideas to help people either reach out or build one another up. So we've been including things that people have told us they're doing in the church family as a way of saying to other people, you can do this uh, and uh, encouraging them to have a go. So things like someone who made cakes for all their neighbours in their close or, or the box of books that uh, Jeremy was referring to earlier, just giving people ideas of practical things that they can do to reach out. Since Events Week uh, uh, finished, we've also included two videos encouraging people to continue to use the videos that were produced. I think we're also conscious that uh, our website is now more important than ever, and therefore we're trying to, uh, to work hard to make sure that our website is up to date and that our website is useful both for the church family, but also and especially for visitors uh, and for uh, non-Christians. I guess the other thing, uh, other way in which we're trying to keep evangelism central is just in godliness. Uh, we, uh, we began with, uh, with 1 Timothy, or I began with 1 Timothy. Paul is writing so that people will know how to conduct themselves. And the fact is that if we are not living godly lives before other people, we will undermine the gospel that we preach. We will, Paul says, cause God's name to be slandered. And I take it that is still true under lockdown. Uh, and therefore, we need to be reminding the church family uh, of the importance of living God godly lives and being distinctive. And the current situation, I think, is a great opportunity for us to stand out and be different uh, from uh, our non-Christian neighbours. Uh, I've been uh, reading a book about John Newton with, um, uh, with uh, a number of uh, friends recently, and I was really struck this week by this quote from John Newton. Most people are most likely to be convinced by what they observe of you than by what they hear from us. We, we can be preaching the great uh, truths of the gospel, but if we're not living those out, we're undermining uh, what we're saying. So that's how we're trying to keep evangelism central in our Sundays and church meetings, our preaching and prayer, uh, our work as elders and staff team, our communications and the way that we live. John. Great, Mike. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you to Mike and Jeremy for sharing um, their passion um, for so many ideas that we can take back to our own uh, local churches and perhaps uh, try to implement. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, uh, again, questions Q&A to Phil. Phil, have you got any questions to kick us off with? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, first one for, for Jeremy. Uh, Pastor's asking a very practical question, Jeremy. Where do we stand with copyright? and using Christianity Explored's resources when streaming. Can you help us with that at all, brother? That, that's fine. I mean, we're very relaxed in Christianity Explored about that. If you have specific questions, you can email me or Ian, Ian Roberts, who's the CEO. But no, go, go ahead. Don't, don't worry about copyright. I think you heard it from Jeremy. They're not going to sue you. Brilliant. So, so go ahead with that one, brothers and sisters. That's great. Uh, next question, which is a really helpful one. How do we initiate personal evangelism when we're in lockdown and those normal kind of rhythms that are not available to us? What, what advice would you, you give? 
Yeah, first of all, I think, Phil, um, you know, we, we can, I think there's something about seeing people face by face. So just Zooming with friends, catching up. And if the opportunity comes, my, th this is the question I love to pose people. Um, do, you mind, do you mind me asking, do you have any particular beliefs? I, I think that's a wonderful question. Just as, as Mike was saying, rather than imposing our agenda on people, just listen to people. I find also most people are not anti the gospel. They just don't know what it is. They're indifferent. They're not negative. We think people are hostile. There's a few, but most people are not. They have no clue what the Christian message is. So just draw them out. Would be So these are my three questions. Do you mind me asking, do you have any particular beliefs? Did you ever look at the Bible? Would you like to have a chat with me about the Bible? It is a Bible study, but a chat, the word one-to-one -one sounds a lot more relaxed, accessible. Mike, have you got anything to add to that? Oh, I, I guess just to say, I, I am very conscious of my own failings in, in personal evangelism. I'm, I'm conscious of how often it feels like there's an opportunity or I, uh, I look back on uh, with hindsight on a conversation and think there was an opportunity that I completely missed. So I, I personally just find it very, very helpful to, to pray, uh, dear God, please give me an opportunity today. And I'm so useless at this that please make it so glaringly obvious that I'm not going to miss it or I'm not going to duck it. Uh, please may it just be very clear and very obvious. Great, so Phil. Linked to, to, to that sort of first question, how do we, in this current period, reach out to those who are not in our address book? Because obviously there's a whole swathe of people who are in lockdown who perhaps are not getting any kind of, of engagement. Perhaps they're tuning into a live stream. We, we, we would pray for that. But how do we get sort of into... Uh, the lives of people on our streets, in our neighbourhoods, who, who we can't meet as easily in lockdown? How do we go beyond our, our address books? Any, any wisdom there? Mike, do you want to go ahead? Uh, thanks very much. I, I, uh, I was really struck by how, I think someone mentioned it in one of the, uh, a previous webinar, but how uh, good the Thursday evenings were just for giving us opportunities to interact with people on our streets. Uh, and um, I, I'm struck that as I uh, go around uh, during the day, if, I, if I'm out for a walk, for example, I, I do think there are opportunities still to be engaging with people when we're, we're out and about in those, in those little ways. Um, I, um, I, I have found it helpful to be part of a, a running club uh, as well. And my, my running club is starting to open up and do different things in small, uh, uh, with small groups of people. And so just being back in those, in those ordinary everyday things where I'm starting to interact with people again, I, I need to make those things a priority uh, and invest in those things and put them in my diary so that I give them time. The other, the other thing I would add, Phil, is social media, which I think somebody just mentioned on the chat. I think the Newton quote from Mike is fantastic. People can observe us on social media. But when we post Christian stuff, it's got to be really short. Mike mentioned that. Not, not, not a sermon. They're not going to watch that. But two, three minutes. Rico Tice did something recently, a, a kind of a tribute to a paramedic in All Souls who died. That kind of thing, a story that someone might look into. Thank you, Phil. In terms of uh, events we might put on, what, what do you think works well for streaming? If we're thinking about evangelism in lockdown, particularly like an, an events kind of thing, what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I personally, well, whatever the church wants, basically, but most churches seem to use Zoom and then um, live feed onto YouTube and Facebook. Um, and uh, allowing questions anonymously is really important. That Mike mentioned this, people are awkward. To sign up for a course is a huge step. So baby steps. And um, yeah, so for example, um, I did one over the weekend, um, Janice knows, with uh, the Association of Evangelists. I think we had many more people on YouTube than on Zoom. So that's the best combo, I think. In terms of type of events, uh, Mike, you mentioned what you did as a church at St. Neots. Any, any particular yeah. things that you think worked extremely well? So I, um, I, th I think Jeremy mentioned this in, in what he said, but I, my observation would be that the interviews uh, were uh, engaging for people and people found those easier to share on social media than the, uh, the lunchtime apologetics. Uh, they were a bit more in your face, a bit more direct. Um, I think the interviews were a kind of easy step in and an easy listen. Uh, for people and I, I think for for us we had a couple of interviews that stood out one was with a, a lady who's been uh, nursing on a, a covid ward 
Um, that, that was one of them. The other interview was with one of our uh, church members who works for the RSPB and he was just talking about the environment. I think those two uh, uh, really stood out. There, there was another interview on the issue of suffering, uh, which I think people listened to. Uh, they, they were the three across the week that I think got the biggest hits uh, from people. Phil, probably time for one more question. Okay, so it's a really sort of a good one to finish with. And a couple of people have mentioned in this. So it's obviously something that's being felt by more than, than one person. Um, there's a feeling that as lockdown goes on, people are actually getting more apathetic. So at the beginning, there was a big clamour for, for people to be reaching out and to, to be engaging with us as Christians. But there's a sense in which that isn't an ongoing thing necessarily. Uh, any sort of wisdom on that? How do we do this over the long term, especially if, as John mentioned at the beginning, it might still be several months before churches can do the things that they, they normally do. Any, any advice on that if people are becoming more hard-hearted as lockdown continues? Well, I have to say that hasn't been my experience at all, but one of the things we were talking about in our small group is that like everybody's different, right? The, the brother from Sazara says, look, it's pretty much impossible to do stuff. For me, I have my secret weapon of incurable cancer, right? I haven't found that at all. I, I think it is a marathon, right? And marathon should be part of our life. What do we need most of all? We need to love the Lord Jesus more. That's what Mike said. That's our biggest problem, that we don't love him as we should. And evangelism is like an iceberg. And if the rest of the iceberg is not there, it's going to sink. So if there's one thing as Christians we need to do, we need to love him more. We need to know him more. Just what Mike said. I guess the other thing that, sorry, I guess the other thing that I would add is that I know from my own experience that when I, uh, when I pray for opportunities, when I ask the Lord to give me opportunities, they're much more likely to come. When I, when I stop doing that, I stop looking, I stop thinking about it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, brothers, for uh, stimulating us and challenging us and encouraging us. We really, really appreciate it. Why don't I pray as we finish? Father, thank you very much for this time that we've spent together. Thank you for encouraging us, but thank you also for challenging us. We want to ask and pray that we might be those who make the most of the opportunity that we have to declare the glorious good news of the Lord Jesus. We pray that we might be those who love the Lord Jesus more so that we want to speak to people of him. We ask and pray that we might be those who have a confidence in the gospel, who are not ashamed of it, Thank you for that reminder that the majority of people are not hostile to the gospel. They simply don't know it. Please, would you help us to realise that and to have a greater boldness in speaking um, of the good news of the gospel uh, to others. Help us to lead our churches that we might keep evangelism central. We are conscious that in these times it's easy to become inward looking, to be primarily concerned for the care of the saints. We want to ask and pray that we would also be outward looking and making the most of those opportunities. Thank you that for many, there have been opportunities to build links with neighbours, with people um, in the street, um, uh, where we didn't have relationships uh, prior to the lockdown. We pray that we might continue to do that and make the most of those newly opened up opportunities. We commit to you particularly, Jeremy, and ask and pray that you would keep him, uphold him, and use him in his evangelistic ministry. May it bear mm. much fruit. Mm. We pray, Father, for St Neots, and we ask and pray that the mission that they held would again bear fruit, that those who watched those videos and heard the gospel would be convicted in their hearts and might turn to the Lord Jesus. We pray for all of us as we have uh, uh, new people and unbelievers listening into our services. May your word do its work of revealing the Lord Jesus to them and bringing them to repentance and faith in him. And we ask this for Jesus' sake and his glory. Amen.